Hi, my name is Deb Vanderhall and I'm the manager for bariatric and weight loss operations and clinical programs for Alina Health. I'm so glad to have you as part of the team caring for our weight loss surgery patients. If you're watching this video, you are completing part of your orientation requirements and are one of the key members in one of the key departments that cares for our patient population. One of the things that's important to understand for patients undergoing weight loss surgery is that this is not a procedure that's taken lightly. We say you didn't gain your weight overnight, you're not gonna have surgery overnight. Our patients go through a lot of preparation getting ready for weight loss surgery. The first thing patients need to do is attend an online or in-person informational seminar. When patients come to a seminar, they get a packet of information that goes through a lot of the information you're gonna hear in this presentation. So they're getting information on the disease of obesity, what obesity disease is, uh, what the criteria is for weight loss surgery, and what they can expect for life after weight loss surgery. When the patient comes into the clinic then for their first appointment, they get a program manual. This manual was designed by our team and provides the patient with a variety of information to assure that they have the knowledge they need and tools in place to succeed after weight loss surgery. There's chapters in here on nutrition and healthy eating. There's a chapter on activity and movement. There's a wellness chapter for life balance, sleep hygiene, relaxation, stress management. And then there's chapters for nutrition and nursing care, both before and after surgery. Every patient gets a copy of this manual when they enter our program. And at the end of this presentation, I'm gonna show you how you can find all of this content on the AKN. So if you have a patient who says, I didn't bring my binder, no problem, we have it on the AKN and we can print out the pages we need if we have to. Or if you have a patient that had surgery years ago and is really struggling and they're just looking for resources and information, this manual is also available to them. We have it on alinahealth.org slash WLS for weight loss surgery. And they just go under the resource tab on the right side of the screen and it'll say patient education manual surgical program they're more than welcome to access this information. Once the patients are ready for surgery, at that point they've met with a surgeon or provider at least twice, they've met with a dietitian twice, they've undergone a psychological evaluation, and they've had any medical clearances that would prepare them to be deemed safe for surgery. So if they need pulmonary clearance or cardiology clearance, they would have all of that work done before they'd get scheduled for surgery. So you have a patient coming in who's been through a lot and they're really excited to be having their weight loss surgery procedure. Once they get scheduled for surgery, patients then attend a pre-op class. They get yet another packet of information. And one of the things that's important to know about this pre-op class, for those of you on the acute care floors and in the recovery room, is they get a care map. And on that care map, it tells them exactly what to expect when they're in the hospital. I think it's important to know that our patients are in the hospital typically for 1.2 days. Our average patient is a white woman in her mid-40s with a BMI in the mid-40s. Do we do surgery on super morbidly obese patients that have BMIs in the 60s, 70s, and 80s? We do, but that is not our typical population. You're already caring for bariatric patients. You're just caring for them related to the other disease processes that they have. So in this presentation, I want to give you foundational information to be able to care for our patients after they've had weight loss surgery. But I also think it's important to know who we are and what we do. Alina Health has made a strong commitment to serve the needs of the obese population, and I couldn't be prouder. I'm so happy to be part of this team because I think that this is a marginalized population and it contributes to so many other disease processes that you guys are seeing every day. So in weight management, we are renaming and rebranding. By the time you watch this video, we should be Alina Health Weight Management, and we have four programs in five locations. And I'm gonna go through each of those programs briefly just to give you an idea of the services that we offer. 
Our first programs are individual medical weight loss program, and that's led by Dr. Roxana Mers at the Abbott Northwestern location, and Dr. Stephanie Stanton sees patients over at United's Bariatric Center. This is an intensive, medical focused program with the physician bariatrician and a dietitian. We don't believe in just giving someone a pill for weight loss. We believe in lifestyle and behavior change. So the dietitians work very closely with the patients to learn some of those behaviors and teach healthy eating habits. A lot of people don't know how to cook. They don't know what to cook, when to cook, what to eat. And so the dietitians are instrumental in helping meet the patient where they're at so they can learn some of those success factors for keeping weight off after an intervention. About 90% of the patients in this program are on a medication for weight loss. There is criteria for this program. You need to have a BMI greater than 30 because it is billed out to the insurance companies. Um, and you can see the other criteria listed on this slide. Our group medical weight loss program was designed in response to primary care providers who were frustrated by the fact that Medicare does not cover dietitian visits. So the primary population in this program are Medicare recipients because the dietitian visits aren't covered. And so it's a group program, and I say this one kind of skims the surface of weight loss. It's um, an overview of healthy behaviors, healthy nutrition, and healthy goal setting. And so this one is led by our nurse practitioner, Karen Prado. We have sessions at both Abbott and United if we have groups that are large enough. The groups start at the beginning of each quarter, so January, April, July, and October. And um, there are six sessions that are two hours in length. And again, these are billed out to insurance, so uh, it's a nice option for patients to have a covered service. Our Kids and Teens program is designed for children of any age with the goal of intervening on overweight and obesity disease before these children become overweight or obese adults that need weight loss surgery. It is a highly integrated multidisciplinary program and you can see the team members listed here. Uh, it's partnered very closely with Courage Kenny Kids and it's led by Dr. Brad Linden who's a pediatric surgeon with Pediatric Surgical Associates, um, but also does adult and children's bariatric surgery. Now, not all children are gonna have surgery. There's a very strong medical focus with this program as well, and Dr. Stephanie Stanton is the medical bariatrician for this program as well. And what happens in this program is the child and family come in, they meet with the multidisciplinary team for a treatment plan. They also get evaluated by Courage Kenny Kids staff. And then they go out to a Courage Kenny location in the community for three months of uh, physical therapy and nutrition education. And then they come back in and check back in every three months with the medical team. There could be some older adolescents that end up having weight loss surgery with this program, but that's not the primary focus of this program. It also has criteria for um, the level of obesity for children. So not any child can enroll in this program. There are certain percentiles on the growth charts that they would need to meet to be a candidate for this program. And then our surgical program is led by Dr. Charles Spenson. He's my dyad partner in the clinic division. So we work together on the programs and services for weight management at Alina. And last year, our surgical program did over 750 cases in 2016. So the program continues to grow. We offer four different procedures, and I'll go through those shortly. And there is criteria for weight loss surgery as well. And these are really driven by the payers. So each insurance company has criteria that needs to be met for patients to qualify for weight loss surgery. And the procedures are done at the four hospital locations. United Hospital, Abbott Northwestern Hospital, Mercy Hospital, and St. Francis Regional Medical Center. Obesity sensitivity for our population is very important. During your orientation, you'll be asked to complete an e-learning in the learning management system on the AKN. So please make sure that you do that learning sometime during your orientation. So let's go to the procedures. What operations do we do for weight loss? 
there's two types of surgery. There's restrictive surgery that simply limits how much you can eat, and there's restrictive and malabsorptive surgery. Those operations limit not only how much you can eat, but they also change the way your body absorbs nutrients and calories. The adjustable gastric band was a procedure that was very uh, common in the early 2000s. Uh, as of 2017, we're no longer offering this operation at Alina Health. Uh, we found that there were many issues with the band itself. It could erode through the stomach, it could become um, detached, the tubing in the device would become disconnected, it could become infected, and the weight loss with this operation was not as good as we would like. If someone can only have one surgery in their lifetime, we felt that this was not the best operation for them. What kind of took its place is a surgery called sleeve gastrectomy. And you can see from the slides here, it shows before the normal anatomy and then it shows the anatomy after the operation. So the sleeve gastrectomy surgery actually cuts the stomach into a pouch that's kind of narrow and shaped like a banana. So this animation is actually going to show you the operation itself. This is an animation that patients see when they come to the informational seminar. We think it's important that they understand what the procedures are because it truly is their choice as to which operation they want to have done. So they see what laparoscopic surgery means and what it looks like. They also understand that surgery is done with long-handled instruments through the belly to give them a greater appreciation for the two-week pre-op liquid diet. Every patient has to do a liquid diet to decrease liver and belly fat prior to the procedure. They also learn what normal digestion and anatomy looks like so they understand how food comes down the esophagus into the stomach and out through the small intestine. And then they can see what the sleeve gastrectomy procedure looks like. And I'm actually going to pause this as it plays. All right, so we'll stop it there. And so on this video, you can see how they create this narrow sleeve. This sleeve holds about an ounce and a half. And then the remnant stomach, as it's called, is actually taken out through one of the trocars. They bag it and actually can pull it out. So after surgery, this is what you're watching for in your assessments, is a leak along this staple line. There could be a misfire of a staple or um, one of the staples let's go and so then gastric contents would actually be leaking into the abdominal cavity. The other thing that can happen with this surgery is you can have a narrowing of this part of the sleeve so you can get a stricture there and patients will report that they just feel like they can't eat solid foods or that things aren't flowing through very well. That would tend to happen a little later after surgery. That's not gonna happen um, in, in the immediate post-op phase. The other thing that can happen is sometimes that sleeve will start to twist um, over time and then we have to use an endoscope and go down there and try and straighten things out. So then at the end of this animation, it shows the patient how that remnant stomach is removed and then how they eat a smaller portion of food and they feel satisfied sooner with less food. And that's how the weight loss happens. Many patients will ask, how much does that stretch over time? We don't know, but we can tell that it's not gonna stretch to what the size was of the old stomach. And then the digestion is normal through the intestines because we have not done any rerouting of the intestines. So that's the sleeve gastrectomy. Some of the advantages of the sleeve gastrectomy is that there's no foreign body. This procedure actually works better for patients that need to take a lot of medications after surgery. So some of our transplant patients would do better with this procedure because it just tolerates more pills. There's less risk for malabsorption with this procedure. So nutritional deficiencies aren't as much of an issue with this population. The disadvantages with this operation is that the weight loss can be a little bit less than with the gastric bypass. And if a patient has reflux, this may not be the operation for them because that narrow sleeve is a high pressure system. And so it actually pushes what little remaining gastric juices there are back up into the esophagus and patients can complain of GERD. So most of the time you'll see patients with or without a history of GERD going home on a PPI such as omeprazole. 
The next procedure is the Roux-en-Y gastric bypass. This had been the gold standard until about 2015. And now nationally, we're really seeing a shift to the sleeve gastrectomy, but this is still a great operation. For patients that have had di type two diabetes for less than two years, there's about 100% resolution of diabetes with this particular operation. With this operation, the surgeon first creates a small little pouch of stomach. It's about the size of my thumb. It holds about an ounce and then they bypass part of the small intestine. So this procedure not only changes how much somebody can eat, but it also changes how they're absorbing the nutrients and calories in their food. So again, it's done laparoscopically. We cut the skin, we spread the muscles, so we really have decreased the incidence of incisional hernias in this population. They just don't happen. Both the sleeve and the bypass take about an hour and a half. If a patient has gallstones with a gallbladder ultrasound before surgery, we would do a coli at the same time. So they create this small little pouch of stomach. It's about the size of my thumb. It holds about an ounce. And then they go down and dissect the small intestine. They're actually gonna bring one end up to that new little pouch. And then at the end of this animation, they'll reconnect the other end. So with this operation, you now have this pouch that's about the size of my thumb, holds about an ounce, and you have a staple line here, you have a staple line on the old stomach, you have a staple line here. This is the gastrojejunal anastomosis. That anastomosis tends to develop ulcers if patients start smoking again after surgery or with this operation if they use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. And we'll talk about that later, but because the gastric juice is hitting that intestinal mucosa, the mucosa is not used to getting straight gastric acid like that, so it's very fragile. And then the non-steroidals or smoking vasoconstriction can really affect that site. So you're gonna see ulcers here, and then this anastomosis is called the JJ, the jejuno jejunostomy anastomosis. So at the end of the video, you'll see this reconnect. This is called the Roux limb. This is called the biliopancreatic limb because it's got the bile and pancreatic juices coming down. And then after they reconnect down here, this is the common channel. So this is where the nutrients of the food are absorbed. So this is the intestinal bypass here, Ruin Y. So it's creating this Y shape. Many patients will also ask what happens to the old stomach? It's still attached with all of the mesentery and arteries and vessels that are holding it in place. And it's still producing gastric juices. It's still a functioning organ. And so we leave it alone. Uh, so I'll put the animation back on now so you can see what it looks like when the food is introduced at the end of the video. So now you see the JJ anastomosis has been made. Food comes down into the small stomach, flowing down the Roux limb. Gastric juices meet up here, and now you're absorbing your nutrients at the bottom. And one of the things that'll trick patients is they think they can eat more then because they've got, they've got this bypass. But the thing we try and teach them is people that suffer from the disease of obesity have bodies that are really good at holding on to extra calories. And so you, you can out eat this operation. If you're eating foods that are really high in calories or um, we call them the slippery slidey. So cheese and crackers, chips and salsa, ice cream, chocolate. I don't like any food on a spoon. They make me really nervous because those tend to be creamed foods or foods that are much more calorie dense. So really teaching patients, one of the things I like to tell a patient is if when they're eating, they should be stabbing their food with a fork and cutting it with a knife. We want them eating whole nutritious pieces of meats, fruits, vegetables, and then their carbohydrates should always be last, but they should be eating real food after these operations. So if you admit a patient who had surgery years ago and they're talking about eating a lot of soups or ground meats, it's worth asking a few more questions. And I have a slide at the end about asking for nutrition information on readmission, but it's something to think about is what are people eating? Because they should be eating a whole food diet. So with the gastric bypass, this operation has a higher amount of weight loss. As I said before, it's better for our diabetic patients, but it also resu uh, results in better comorbid condition resolution 
uh, than some of the other procedures. The disadvantages with this procedure is because of the malabsorption, patients are at higher risk for vitamin and mineral deficiencies. So it's very important that they take their supplements as we have asked them to. There's also something called dumping syndrome. And dumping syndrome is a simple issue of concentrated sugar or fat. So after this operation, if you think about it, you've got that small little stomach connecting to that anastomosis. And if a patient eats a really high sugar load, there's no pyloric valve regulating the flow of that sugar into the small intestine. So they can get a dump of sugar really quickly into the small intestine and they'll feel clammy, shaky, sweaty. Their heart will be racing. It takes about 20 minutes before it hits. It lasts about 20 minutes and then it's done. Not every patient gets dumping and you don't get dumping every time. So sometimes they may eat a chocolate chip cookie and they're fine. And the next time they eat a chocolate chip cookie and really can feel their body reacting to that sugar. So that's what dumping syndrome is. So on the diets, you'll see uh, we ask for juices to be offered cut 50-50 with water. And that's why, because fruit juices tend to have a lot of sugar. And so if you dilute them with water, you can help avoid some of those dumping syndrome symptoms. Another procedure is the duodenal switch. Uh, this is a procedure that was done a lot at the University of Minnesota. We had some physicians at Abbott Northwestern that did it. We have one physician right now, Dr. Doc, down in Shakopee, who does it at United, Abbott, or St. Francis. So you may see this operation as well. And what this one is, is a combination of the sleeve gastrectomy and the intestinal bypass. So it's actually doing both. With a regular gastric bypass, we bypass about a quarter of the small intestine, and we leave about three quarters for absorption. With a duodenal switch, reverse that. We actually only leave about three feet for absorption. So this procedure is a highly malabsorptive procedure, and it's typically reserved for patients that have a BMI greater than 50. So our super morbidly obese population may be candidates for this operation. It's got very good weight loss and very good resolution of comorbid conditions. The challenge with this operation is if the patient is not committed to follow up and to taking their supplements as we recommend, they can get pretty sick pretty quickly with vitamin and mineral deficiency. So something to keep in mind. Because this is a bigger operation, the patients tend to be in the hospital a little bit longer, typically two days, sometimes three. Um, the other one with this one is bowel movements. Because that common channel is so short, there's a lot of undigested food that goes into the large intestine and the gut microbes feed off that food. And so these patients can have some pretty foul smelling flatulence and loose stools. Uh, some can learn how to regulate that. Others really struggle with the smell and the frequency. Um, but more often than not, for this population, it's not an issue. Uh, and again, this is not a high volume procedure that we're doing. A new one that we're offering is called the Intergastric Balloon. This is a self-pay program uh, that we launched in 2017. It's $8,100. And it's for a balloon that's inserted into the stomach endoscopically. It stays in the stomach for six months. And with that package that patients pay for, the $8,100, it includes one year of dietitian support for nutrition and lifestyle and behavior changes. And then the RN is also available to help coach the patient before and after the procedure. But this is what the balloon looks like. So this balloon is inserted endoscopically deflated. And then each of these balloons is filled with 500 cc's of saline. It stays in the stomach for six months. And the concept is that it creates a sense of satiety and hunger suppression so that the patient can learn healthier eating behaviors and jumpstart their weight loss. And then the balloons come out, they continue on with the dietitian for another six months, reinforcing the lifestyle and behavior change. Um, it is for lower BMI though. You need to have a BMI between 30 and 40 is what the FDA approval is for right now. But for those of you watching that work in radiology or the ED, I can envision that you're gonna start seeing some of these in patients. I know the Mayo Clinic is using one called Orbera. It's a single balloon. Uh, as well as Fairview Southdale. Minnesota Gastro is putting them in down at Fairview Southdale. This particular brand is called Reshape. So if you want to learn more about that, you can go to reshapeready.com 
and it's got the animation of what this balloon is and everything. So pretty interesting procedure that we're doing. So we did surgery. Now, how do you take care of them after surgery? Well, they're pretty easy to take care of, but when they get sick, they get sick quickly. So you do need to be doing thorough assessments on them, but we want them up and moving so they can go home before three o'clock the next day. So in this population, they can shower without a dressing on the first day after surgery. And physical activity is really important for this population. Bariatric patients are uh, at higher risk for developing blood clots because of their obesity. So it's important to get them up and get them moving after surgery. So we want patients walking the evening of surgery and they should walk at least seven times the next morning. And one of the things that's really helpful to do is put little tick boxes or little lines on the care board so that patients can be responsible to mark that stuff off when they've done that. You do not need to be their keeper because they're gonna go home in less than 24 hours and they need to know how to manage themselves when they get home. So so if you do the instruction, they've already heard this information when they came to pre-op class, so they're gonna be expecting it. So just put some marks on. You can get them up the first couple times until you feel like they're safe. And then when you do the bedside handoff, you can just report off on how they're moving and if they can be up independently. That way the oncoming nurse and the patient both know what the plan is for activity on the next shift. The other thing that's important with this population is whenever they're drinking anything, they really need to be sitting up. So even head of the bed is not enough. Once they're to the point where they're doing their clear liquid diet, you need to have them up in a chair. The fluids just tend to go down much better when they're sitting up straight. And then for this population, there is no lifting restriction. Our motto is if it hurts, don't do it. Um, so we don't restrict any activity on these patients. We don't want them driving until they're off their pain medication. So typically we tell them to give it about a week that they should plan on having someone if they need a ride anywhere. And then for returning to work, our recommendation is always two weeks. And part of that is just to develop habits and patterns. It takes a while to figure out what tastes good, what fluids are working, what protein powder am I gonna use now? Because one of the things that happens after surgery is for some reason your taste buds change. And you might have had this protein powder you were using before surgery that you really liked, and then they, after surgery, they're like, it just tastes like metal, or the flavors change. And so we tell patients, don't buy gallons of stuff before surgery because you never know what's gonna taste good after surgery. But they really need to figure out can I have a bottle of water at work? We have some guys that operate machine presses and stuff and they can't have fluids on the line. Well, then how are you gonna get 64 ounces of fluid in every day? You know, that's the goal by day three after surgery. How are you, so getting patients to think about how are you gonna meet those goals when you get home so that you're safe and that you don't end up being readmitted with dehydration or something. Patients get IV fluids the evening of surgery. Some of the patients may have an upper GI ordered. If they do, they're strict NPO. So for those of you in surgical services, uh, PACU especially, uh, and the post-op acute care unit, these patients cannot have ice chips after surgery. It really um, blurs the assessment for the surgeon. If we think there's anything going on, it's hard to ascertain if the ice chips are Pain, you know, coloring the picture a little differently. The other thing with this population is they tend to have a lot of stomach spasms. So things that are very hot or very cold can be uncomfortable for this population. And so allowing fluids to get to room temperature and having patients drink room temperature liquids tends to work better with this population. You'll have an order for a bariatric clear liquid diet. The thing to remember with this population is we want them to start with small sips. So we actually have you take two med cups and fill them each halfway, and we have little kits on acute care. So they'll have med cups, a timer, a water bottle, a tracking sheet, and a golf pencil. And you'll do teaching with the patient to give them those materials, and they'll pour from the water bottle, because again, it's got the pop-up top, and right on here it says no straws, so you don't want them sucking out of the water bottle. We want them to pour 15 cc's in each med cup, and then they're gonna drink one med cup, put it down. Okay, that went okay. Then they're gonna drink the other med cup, put it down. Then they're gonna set the timer for 15 minutes. They can use their phone if they have one, or there's timers on the acute care nursing units. You set the timer for 15 minutes, they refill their two little med cups halfway, 
When the timer goes off at 15 minutes, they drink another ounce. And then on a tracking sheet that they get in pre-op class that you will have available on the AKN that I'm gonna show you at the end of this presentation, they can use the golf pencil to check off their ounces. So now the patient's responsible for tracking their fluid intake and not you. Because when they get home, they need to be tracking how much fluid they're drinking, okay? No straws after surgery because you tend to swallow air with straws and when your stomach's only this big, any extra fluid in your stomach creates this incredible sense of pressure. So after surgery, if patients are complaining of chest pain, ask them, is it pain or is it pressure? Because the, all of the new little stomachs are right here. And so they've got two things working again, well, three actually. They've got the swelling of surgery. They've got the fluid that's going into this already swollen space. And then they have the lap gas that's riding up underneath their diaphragm, creating this pressure, okay? So sometimes patients will say they're having chest pain when in fact what they're really having is pressure and they're getting used to their new little stomach. So slowing down what they're drinking, making sure fluids are room temperature, sometimes warm will work better, um, can help make sure that patients are getting enough fluids in. For pain management, patients are on IV medications the evening of surgery, and then the next morning they'll be converted to orals. Some of the physicians are actually okay with converting to orals evening of, so please make sure you check your post-op orders. Um, we have five bariatric surgeons in the system, and they actually work at all the locations from time to time. So you can get in a real routine of the regular person that operates at your hospital, but pay attention to your orders if you have a surgeon you're not familiar with to make sure that you're following the orders that they're using off the order set. Uh, they'll get a discharge prescription for oral pain medication. We want that filled here. And if they have discharge prescriptions for um, omeprazole or another PPI, we want those filled here. More often than not, when we do our 48-hour post-op nursing phone call and patients are having problems with fluids, they did not fill, or if they did, they haven't been taking the PPI. So really important that they take that medication when they're at home. Another medication that we're concerned about are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. They can cause ulcers or bleeding, most commonly in the Roux-en-Y gastric bypass. So our sleeve gastrectomy in old band patients we're not as concerned about non-steroidals, but what you'll see us do in Excellion is we're gonna flag the chart under allergies and contraindications uh, for NSAIDs. So it'll be a sensitivity listed in there. Patient had gastric bypass surgery, should not use NSAIDs ever because we don't want them on long-term non-steroidals. Now, as an acute care nurse, you could say, but the post-op order set includes Toradol, and it does, and we want you to give the Toradol, but then after that, we don't want them on NSAIDs after they've had a ruin y gastric bypass. So acetaminophen is a good alternative for patients to try. Otherwise, um, they'll need other pain management planning. Another consideration is nausea and vomiting. It's important after surgery to stay ahead of the nausea. So make sure that you're medicating for nausea with the Zofran. And then the other consideration with not really nausea, but just comfort with medications is um, patients are instructed not to take medications that are bigger than the size of an eraser on a pencil, uh, especially for the first few weeks after surgery. Once they have healed and they feel comfortable, they can start trying larger size pills. But right after surgery, you're going to make sure that you're cutting, crushing, or splitting their meds if they're um, too big. And in the pre-op class, patients are told that they should think about that before surgery so that if they need a different prescription, they've taken care of that before they come in the hospital. A common one we see is Wellbutrin XL. That's like trying to swallow a horse pill. And so we'll tell the patients to go to the provider that prescribes the Wellbutrin and get the order changed to um, one that they would take many times a day. So another consideration to think about. We're big on preventing blood clots, so you'll see patients with an order for heparin. And then at discharge, patients will hold all of their supplements until they're seen in the clinic. They may have that prescription for a PPI and we want it filled before they go. Um, and if they have a BMI greater than 60, you may be doing some discharge teaching for Lovenox um, injection. 
This is the most common equipment you'll see on the nursing unit. Not all of the providers use drains, so some of the sites you're not going to see drains on acute care. We ask patients to bring their own CPAPs in, so that should be happening. And the other one that is helpful is to pull the incentive spirometer out of the bag, um, out of the belongings bag. Our patients move so quickly that we often find they're packing up to go home and the spirometer was never taken out of the bag. So when you go to get the spirometer out of the bag, grab this out of the bag too, because all of your discharge teaching is in this book, okay? So if you grab this book, I'm gonna show you at the end of this how to find the discharge teaching, um, but grab the book and the spirometer and you've got what you need and then go get your dehydration water bottle bag and you're good to go. You have what you need to take care of that patient um, after surgery. So for complications, there are risks associated with abdominal surgery. And these would be risks if you were having an appendix removed, if you were having your gallbladder taken out. Um, so patients, again, see this list before surgery. The main complication we talk to patients about off this list are blood clots. And we really stress they need to get up and get walking the evening of surgery. And they expect that. So as the manager, when I was managing just the Abbott location, I would get patients complaints that nobody got them up on the evening shift. And then I'd go to investigate and PACQ was on a hold because acute care didn't have any beds and they didn't get up to the unit till like 8.30 or 9 in the evening. Those patients were still expecting that they would have been walked. So know that they wanna walk, they're ready to walk. And many of our patients, because of the pain from the gas, um, they'll walk all night if you let them, and we tell them to. It'll just help reabsorb that gas more quickly. So if they want to be up and walking around and you think they're safe, let them do it. Acute care post-op complications, these are the big hitters. Um, you will be registered every year for complication training in the LMS system. So know that that's just mandatory training that you have to do once a year. Uh, but for now, I know that nurses in acute care can handle nausea and vomiting, you can handle a blood clot, and you can handle uh, DVT, PE, and bowel obstruction, okay? But the two I want to focus on are two that are really important for bariatric surgery. And the first one is that anastomotic leak. So they're leaking from one of those staple lines. Either the staple line didn't hold, or there was a misfire, and a staple didn't catch like they thought it did but you literally have gastric contents leaking into the abdominal cavity. So listed here are the signs and symptoms that you would be assessing for. And the challenge with this whole list is people that are of a larger size tend to have a higher heart rate, they have a higher respiratory rate anyway. So if I were to thin this list down to the one thing you're watching for, it's an impending sense of doom. Your gut just says something's not right, and patients will say something's not right. And every time I've gone to acute care and we think that there's something going on with a patient, it is the nurse at the bedside just saying something, something's off. And you're not going to have solid black and white data that vital signs are off or anything. It's just this sense that something's not right. And the beauty with working with this surgeon group is they want to be called. There are sometimes providers that don't appreciate that call from a nurse at the bedside. I can tell you the bariatric surgeons want to be called. So if you're at all concerned about a patient, gather your data, know what to anticipate for orders, and then call the surgeon with vital signs, make them NPO, put some oxygen on them if they need it, but know that this could be a situation where the surgeon's taking them back down to the OR. In bariatrics, the motto is when in doubt, check it out, and they will go right back in those lap sites and take a look around. It's also not uncommon to um, just observe them for the night. We don't scope our patients within the first month after surgery because of the staples. We try not to put a scope down. So for those of you in radiology, the um, procedure of choice would be to get a CT scan. Um, we do do some video swallows, but we probably wouldn't be doing that if we thought there was a leak, although they might. So uh, you might be seeing our patients down in fluoro or CT as well. For hemorrhage, these are the signs and symptoms of a hemorrhage. It would be unlikely that you would see um, bloody stools because it would take a while for 
um, them to produce a bowel movement. Bloody emesis is possible. Um, also with the stools, there's some bleeding from the creation of that JJ anastomosis. So it's not uncommon for there to be a little bit of a dark stool the first time they go to the bathroom. If you're um, thinking they have a bleed, you'd wanna stop any medications that are blood thinning. So stopping the Toradol, the Coumadin, anything like that. And then anticipate that they might need some fluids or a blood transfusion. Again, the nursing interventions are exactly the same. After discharge, these are the complications that patients are taught to look for when they go home. We also evaluate for these when we do our 48-hour post-op phone call. We do a one-week visit, a five-week visit, a three-month visit, and a six-month visit. So we see these patients a lot after surgery, and this is what we're um, assessing for. This is my slide for those of you in the ED when I said if you get an old, we call them way outs, but they've had surgery a long time ago and you're trying to figure out how surgery is working. What are you eating? When are you eating? How much are you eating? Um, those are all great questions. So if someone reports to the ED with abdominal pain and they were eating a half a chicken breast, some green beans and pasta salad with no problem and in the last three days, every time they start eating chicken or a piece of meat, it just comes right back up. That's a red flag. Something has changed. Something's either obstructed or stenosed or narrowed in part of the anatomy. Something's going on. It's not usual for someone to be able to eat regular whole foods and then things change. Um, so the surgeon would be very interested in knowing that. Now, if you have another patient who had surgery 15 years ago and they're talking about their crema mushroom soup and cheese quesadillas, they could just have maladaptive eating behaviors that they've been doing since they had surgery. The, eat, the softer foods are easier to go down, honestly, so you can eat more. And so sometimes people that um, have behaviors related to food that haven't really worked on those behaviors, you'll find that they, they've got some pretty poor eating habits. They're always welcome to book, come back into our program. If they want to meet with a dietitian, we'd be happy to have them. And I'll show you where the manual is. If they truly want to just kind of check in and see what the current learning is, they are more than welcome to use our patient education manual. And that leads me to the resources. So I have built a web page, and there are a lot of resources on the web page for you. I've got many of them listed here. Um, and I'm gonna show those to you at the end, but I wanna get through these slides because then I'm actually gonna pull the computer that I keep looking down at. I'm gonna pull it forward and take you out to that website. Um, in this PowerPoint, I've got all the paging numbers. A lot of times the new staff don't know that there's paging systems at each site. So I have them listed here and I will have this PowerPoint loaded with the slides so you can actually download this PowerPoint if you want it. But a and paging looks like this and you would click here for the on-call providers. Mercy has a paging system. You have to click down at the bottom here to find out who's on call, but you can do just text paging during the day to the regular provider, or then you go down to the on-call schedules after hours. Um, at St. Francis, Dr. Doc wants to be called directly on his cell phone, and if it's the weekend or after hours, you would use the Am I On schedule that's loaded at that site. United also has a paging site, so you click here where it says Quick Links, and it's a drop-down. It'll tell you who's on call for bariatrics. So lots of resources online for you. And now this is going to get a little sloppy because I'm going to pull this straight forward to me so I can show you where the website is. So all of the resources are loaded out on the AKN. So if you go to the Internet and you go under Sites, and then go under clinical service lines. So just remember, bariatrics is part of the clinical service lines now. We go across all the sites. You know you got to the right place when you get to all those colorful little tabs. And we are the entire bottom left-hand side of this page, okay? So it says bariatrics here. Everything under that word belongs to us. So the care map is out here. There's a video that you're gonna have patients watch before they go home on the post-op diet. Um, the patient education manual is here. So if you click on this, it's actually redirecting me to alinahealth.org slash WLS for weight loss surgery. So now we're on the patient side of Alina Health 
and down at the bottom, boom, there's our manual. So if you had a patient in the hospital and they didn't bring their book in, no problem. I'll open it for you on the computer in your room. You open it, all the chapters are right here. So you can go to the care after surgery chapter and then you can just go down through the pages. What do you do if you have a fever? What do you do if you have redness or drainage from your incision? It's all right here. So all of the information you would need to do your discharge teaching is right on the AKN. Now I'm gonna go back. So now I'm going back on the AKN. And the other one that I think is always helpful for acute care nurses is to know where this emergency care of the bariatric patient is. This is a poster by the Surgeons National Organization. And what it tells you is what the most common complications are, what the assessment should be, and how you would know if the surgeon's probably gonna say this person has to go back to surgery. So here's an example of intra-abdominal bleeding, okay? So it shows you what the emergency presentation is, what the assessment and treatment would be, and the patient would go back to surgery if. And so this is a really nice document. You can see over here on the left, it has all the procedures. So it's a reminder of all of the operations. There's just a lot of good information out here. So know that that's out there. And there's just a lot of other information on this website. So feel free to poke around out here and see what else you can learn about bariatrics. I hope this presentation has given you enough information to feel confident in caring for a post weight loss surgery patient at one of our locations. If you ever have any questions on how to care for a patient, please feel free to reach out to the surgeon, the nurse practitioner, physician assistant, or bariatric nurse clinician. We'd be happy to help you in better understanding the patient care needs for this population. Thank you.